So we just finished a, a sermon series, as you might guess, related to Christmas uh, through the Advent season, and we have uh, less than a month's worth of messages in the book of 2 Corinthians. We've, we've preached through 1 and 2 Corinthians, and we're just rounding out 2 Corinthians. Um, it's an exciting book, and it's got some cool information to share. So if you have your Bible with you, even if this is your first Sunday with us, feel free to join us. You can grab, grab your Bible, or if you don't have one, there's one in the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab that. And uh, if you're using that Bible like I am, we're going to be on page 1,163. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 today. So I wanted to share a story with you guys before we start. And it, this is, a, as you might guess, this is a, a fictitious story, but I think it relates to uh, what we're going to talk about today. Years ago, I had heard this story told that there was a door-to-door salesman, a young man from the big city who was going out into rural areas trying to sell his wares uh, to local people. And <clears throat> as he was going between cities, he, he drove through a quite rural area. And while he was doing it, he, he came upon a farmer. And this farmer had a cow that was being born, uh, a calf that was being born out of the mama cow. And it was coming out backwards with its back legs first. And so for those of you who, who don't have a background in that often, you need to help a calf like that get out. And so the farmer got his extracting tool and hooked up to it and was getting ready to help pull that calf loose and, and help mama and calf and uh, that was a couple-minute process, and the salesman saw this from the side of the road and wondered what on earth was going on there. He was real curious, so he, he pulled his car over, and he parked it, and he walked up to the fence, and he sat there, and he just watched as this farmer went through the motions and did things and wondered, well, what is going on here? And after a few minutes, the farmer got the calf out, and the calf seemed to be doing okay, and uh, the farmer looked over and, and saw this uh, young man from the city standing over there watching the calf, and he said, sir, is, is, are you okay? Is there anything I can help you with? And the salesman said, man, I got to tell you, I've just been sitting here wondering, how fast do you think that calf had to be going to get there? <laughs> it may take a second, but... So we have different perspectives on different things. <laughs> uh, and sometimes, sometimes we all look at things differently and, and take different things from it. Sometimes we take the wrong thing from it, though, don't we? And I think that that's really relevant to what we talk about with the Apostle Paul today. Uh, just as a recap, as we head into our passage, so this is the second letter to the church in Corinth. That's why we call it Corinthians. And the church in Corinth was one that the Apostle Paul himself went and helped plant he actually went to this town. He was one of the first people on the ground there, and there were no Christians there to speak of, but Paul went, and he started talking to people about who Jesus was, about what he had seen of Jesus, and the, the eyewitness testimony he had to it, and, and how Jesus had changed his own life. And soon enough, this town went from having, even though it was a major metropolitan area in the Roman Empire, a major port city, soon enough, this town went from having zero Christians to having hundreds of Christians. A bunch of people heard what Paul said, recognized the truth of it, and they started a relationship with God as a result of that. And so Paul planted this church. He spent over a year with them. And then after that, he traveled several weeks away to the, to the city of Ephesus, another major city where he was going to go plant another church at. And while he was in Ephesus, he started hearing about all kinds of broken things happening in the church. There were, there were people who were having incestuous relationships with their own family members. There were people who were coming in and grabbing the communion wine and getting drunk on it, and then there was no, nothing left for anyone to even take communion with. There were people who were exploiting other people in the church financially, or uh, rich people who were coming in and saying, oh, you poor person, get out of my seat, go to the back, I deserve to be up front, you don't. And so all of these problems are there, and as you might guess, that doesn't help a church grow very much, does it? Doesn't make it a healthy, inviting place to be at. And so Paul heard about all this, and he was heart, heartbroken because he had poured so many hours into these people. And so he wrote the letter of 1 Corinthians in response to that problem. And initially, the church in Corinth told Paul to go pound sand. They didn't want to hear it. He, who was he to talk to them about it? They knew better than him anyway. And so Paul sent one of his disciples, Timothy, to talk to him, and they chased him off. Paul went and visited them himself. And they chased him off. And finally, Paul sent another one of his disciples, Titus. Paul is persistent. He wants to get this church back on the right track. Titus went, and he went and talked to them. And somehow God used Titus in that capacity. And finally, the church uh, repented of those sinful practices. They started cleaning up their lives. They were getting on the right track, except for one thing. In that meantime, uh, since Titus had been there, there had been a group of really glamorous, shiny leaders who'd showed up. And Paul will, in the course of 2 Corinthians, refer to these people as the super apostles because they just thought they were better than everybody else. And so he means it in sort of an insulting way. But he's pointing out this is really the way they see themselves. And these super apostles were coming in, and they were saying to the church in Corinth, hey, 
I know that guy led you to Jesus, and I know everything you know about Jesus he basically taught you. But listen, that guy is a moron. Don't listen to him. First of all, look at him. His clothes are not fancy at all. He's dressed like some average Joe. Look at us by comparison. And when he talks, he's not that fancy and charming, but listen to us speak. We're super compelling. And Paul, he's broke. He doesn't even have a lot of money. If God loved Paul, wouldn't he be rich? And, and we're rich, so you should listen to us. And, and they, they continued on with this line of argument using worldly standards to basically say, ignore Paul, but pay attention to us instead. We should be in charge. And so some group in the church is starting to listen to these super apostles, and they're starting to buy into this idea. And, and for some reason, their pitch always seems to end with, oh, and by the way, if you have your checkbooks today, make sure and write a check for your life savings to me. That's what God would want you to do. Kind of like our modern televangelists. This is the vibe that's going on with these super apostles. They're charming, they're shiny, they're pretty, they're rich, they wear the best clothes, they drive the fanciest cars, and a lot of people are wowed by that, but they're not actually looking at these people's character. And so here Paul is, as somebody who planted this church and cares about it, and he sees this corruption in its leadership. This isn't just people coming to the church, this is people who are leading in the church. And is that going to go good places for a church in terms of their health? Well, not at all. So Paul sees that. And throughout this book of 2 Corinthians, Paul's been addressing that problem. In the last couple chapters, Paul addressed how the Corinthians weren't obeying God and their finances. If you want to hear those sermons, you can go back and hear them on our YouTube page. But today, he's changing the subject back. As he closes out this book, we're in chapter 10. There's only a few chapters left. Um, Paul turns back to the super apostles to try to address this deep-seated issue. And it's pretty clear from what we'll read today, the way Paul views ministry in the church and the way the super apostles view ministry in the church, it's really different. And a lot like that cow, only one of them's right about what actually happened. Only one of them really has the information correct. So as I said, go ahead and open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we're going to read and break this down into three different sections today. We'll read each one, we'll stop, we'll discuss it for a moment and kind of pick apart some of the verses in it so we can hopefully understand it better. And God will use that, I hope, to convict you. Uh, we'll start with verses 1 through 6, but before we begin, I actually want to take a moment with you and just ask God once more to, to be in our, work in our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray in these moments that your word would convict us. You chose this sermon for this day with this people here, and me included. And you have something to say to us. And so, Lord, I pray whatever distracted us this week, in this moment, we would focus it on you. You don't owe us forgiveness. You don't owe us grace. You don't owe us your word or your spirit, but you graciously give it anyway. And so, as we have been blessed with such a thing and even blessed to live in a country where we can read this book without fear of being killed for it, I pray we'd leverage this opportunity today. And that as we sit here amongst others, that you would help our hearts to be drawn near to you. Lord, let us leave here changed by what we read. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid, when face to face with you, but bold towards you when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this, of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. You get a little bit lost in that. It would be understandable if you did. Let's go back to the top and just talk about what's being said here. So verse 1. 
Paul starts off by trying to frame the tone he's giving. That's a hard thing with letters. It's hard for people to understand the tone you're using. You've probably seen that in text messages before. You read a text message from somebody and you wonder, is he yelling at me here or is he speaking at a normal volume or what is he intending exactly? And it's easy to get that wrong. Paul is trying to set the tone for what he's saying. He says, by the humility and the gentleness of Christ. That's the way I'm talking to you. I want to talk to you with the same humility that Jesus had. He had the humility to die for you despite being sinless. Uh, and so I, I want to leverage that. And his gentleness, you know, he, never, he was never violent with anybody, uh, despite the fact that there were a whole lot of people who deserved his wrath. And so with that same humility, with that same gentleness of Christ, Paul says, I want to appeal to you. And notice he, he points out here, I, Paul, I'm the one writing this, I'm the one saying it. Paul evokes his own name, which he doesn't often do in the Gospels, but it's for a purpose. Now, Paul is going to start quoting things that are said by the super apostles about him. So he says, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm away. This is one of the things that the super apostles have tried to use to discredit Paul. They're saying, you know, Paul, he seems so bold and so brave and so wonderful when he's a long ways away, but he's kind of a coward. And the minute he gets here in front of you all, he's not going to say what he really thinks then. He is going to be all soft tone. He's not going to be near as compelling. He's going to be the same homely dumb guy who doesn't say smart stuff. Just expect that from him. Don't even listen to him when he writes you these letters. I know he's critiquing us, but definitely ignore that part. We know what we're doing and Paul doesn't. So Paul is, is pointing out this accusation because he knows this is one of the main arguments that his opponents are making. And he's saying that, um, yeah, actually that's not the way it'll be. Verse 2, he says, I beg you that when I come to you, I may not have to be as bold as I expect towards some people who think we are to live by the standards of this world. So now he's saying to them, I hope that you guys will straighten out this mess with the super apostles. Because if you think I'm going to be scared when I get there, you're wrong. I will be bold. And I'm especially going to be bold with those people who are behaving in this inappropriate way. I, I will say it as it is and and." You know, you might think, I'm too scared to, but I'm going to live it out and I'm going to call it out and do what God has called me to do to protect the church. So, so be ready for that when the time comes, or better yet, fix it now and we don't have to have that conversation later. And he, he defines them as people who live by the standards of the world. Now, we're going to get some contrast for that. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the super apostles, so many of the arguments that they have hinge on values that the world has. They're saying, you should listen to me because I look better. You should listen to me because I'm more charming. You should listen to me because I'm more clever. You should listen to me because I have more money or fancier stuff than the other person does or because my life is easier than that person's is. Do people make those arguments in the world today? Yeah, all the time. All the time they make arguments like that. And it's interesting because we very often fall into that, don't we? I mean, it, it has its charms to it. Well, that guy does seem to have a lot of money. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. And maybe the guy does. That's not to say you can't know what you're talking about. Obviously, that's not the case either. But that's not a good reason to simply follow somebody. We should have deeper standards than that. And Paul's saying, that's the standards the super apostles use. But that's not the way that we try to figure out what's right and wrong and how we try to negotiate the challenges that we face in our life. Now, Paul says we instead have spiritual weapons that God has given us. We don't use worldly weapons. We have spiritual weapons God has given us. What's interesting here is Paul doesn't define what all of those are. But if we look in the epistles, if we look through the gospels, we can actually see a bunch of examples of things Paul says are those spiritual weapons. So just to list a few that are super important core spiritual weapons that you have in your life, you have prayer. You can actually stop and you can talk to the God who created the universe and he listens. He hears you. He loves you. Kind of weird that we don't do that sometimes, isn't it? How, how far do you get into your problems when they go wrong before you stop and talk to God about it? I'm embarrassed sometimes about how long it takes me, just to be honest. All right, so we have prayer. We have fasting. When was the last time you fasted when something went wrong? You stopped eating for a day or two and just decided, I'm going to let myself be weak because I know when I'm weak, God is strong, and then maybe God will speak to me and he'll help me resolve this issue. This is one of the most neglected spiritual disciplines in the church today. It's a big thing we miss out on, and we're, we're denying ourselves a greater access to God through it. It's something that the Bible commands in the New and Old Testament. It's a common practice. It's been throughout the entire history of the church. It's been a, a central part of what we've done. So prayer, fasting. Uh, we also have our ability to study God's Word. 
And by the way, in the course of human history and the history of the church, you have more access to God's Word than anybody has had before. It's pretty incredible. It used to be only the rich could even have a copy of this. Half the reason you'd go to church before was because you might actually get to hear something out of the Bible because most people, over 90% of the people, were illiterate throughout most of history. And so for you to even know what God's Word said, you'd need somebody to read it to you. Now, most of our society is literate. We have access to it, not just here, but I've got like 30 versions of it right here on my phone, available all the time. God's Word is right at our hands, but do we use it like it is? How often do we say, man, I'm having this problem right now in my finances or in my marriage or at work. Why don't I stop and try to see what God's Word says about that? When's the last time you did that? Now, beyond all of that, we have God's Holy Spirit. Who, If you have come and had a relationship with Christ, you've been baptized in that relationship with Him, when you made those decisions to follow Jesus, His Spirit starts to intervene in your life. And God will actually start to speak to you and to guide you in some pretty incredible ways if you'll stop and listen. But again, do we do that? Do we stop and wait for the Spirit's guiding when we face trial and tribulation, when things are going wrong? Is that what we do? Paul has laid out for us, we have these weapons But they're what we need to use when we have problems, and so often we don't. The super apostles certainly are not using it, but Paul's pointing out for the church itself, they're not using it either, because if they did, they'd figure out pretty quick, we shouldn't follow those guys over here, these these slick televangelists that we've, we've managed to adopt into our church. They're probably not the people we should have leading us. Maybe we should have more discernment than that, which they would have. So Paul starts talking about what these strongholds are. He says we have, um, in verse 4, he says, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. We've just read this. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So they break down strongholds, which raises the question, what are those strongholds? And he tells us in verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So when we stop and when we pray and when we're struggling in the callings that God has given us, because that's Paul's context, in the calling and in the ministry God's put in our life, and, and not just, it's not just pastors that have a ministry, you have a ministry too. If you are married, you have a ministry to your spouse. If you have family, you have a ministry to them. If you are employed by somebody, you have a ministry there at your work, to your coworkers, to your boss, to your subordinates, to those around you. Uh, you, you have a ministry to the friends that God puts in your life. You know people and work with people and are around people that I will never meet in my life. And God's plan can't be just for Lloyd to do it. He put you there for a reason. He trusts you. He knows you're capable of it. But when you hit a hard time trying to have love for somebody and, and talk to them about the things of the Lord, what's your response? Do you use those weapons God gave you? Or do you go and, and try to resolve it the world's way? Paul says here, we have these tools, and with them, we can demolish arguments. When, when, when people are trying to say, you know what, I don't believe in God because of X, or you know what, I know you're saying this sin is here and I shouldn't do it, but I don't care because of Y, whatever their reason is. But they have all kinds of arguments our society makes and that we make. Um, Paul is saying, if we use those tools God gave us, then God will use that to help demolish those arguments. He'll actually take those things down but not because you're that great, not because you were just the most clever person ever, as the super apostles are claiming, but because God's that great. God likes to use unlikely people to accomplish His work. You look at somebody like Moses. I know Moses is super famous, but if you look back at the story of Moses, when Moses was being called by God to go talk to Pharaoh, Moses told him, I'm too scared to talk to anybody publicly, let alone to go talk to the king of the most powerful country on earth. You got the wrong guy. And yet, God still used Moses. In fact, He intentionally chose Moses in light of this. He knew no one's going to believe it was just Moses when this is all done. They'll know it was me. And God has put you in some situations in your life for the same reason. And that that might sound insulting, but it's certainly the case for me. He's put us in places. He's called us to ministries. And and with the knowledge that you're not good enough, but He is. And we're going to see that theme across our passage today uh, as Paul talks. Now, another thing that we're going to use those tools against is every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. That pretension, that idea of pretentiousness, of us thinking of ourselves as better than we are, this is often one of the things that kills the church. When we get a spirit of arrogance and we start thinking that we're the elite chosen ones and those other people are just dumb people that are are around us or that they're beneath us, those ideas, uh, and sadly, that arrogance is commonplace in the church today, 
but it destroys the church. It erodes it from the inside out. And uh, Paul is saying, using those spiritual weapons God has given us, we can actually destroy that pretentiousness. It's the same pretentiousness that the super apostles are showing. That arrogance where they're just missing Paul outright and trying to say you shouldn't listen to him because he's just not as shiny and fanciful as they are, that logic doesn't hold. And, and Paul here is, is doing this very thing. He's been praying. He's been fasting. He is now under the Spirit's guidance, not only having read God's Word, but he is writing a new version, a new addition to God's Word through the letter of 2 Corinthians to the church in Corinth to address this problem, and not just for Corinth then, but for Myrtle Point today, for all of us to address this problem. And then added to this, the third thing, in doing these things and using those spiritual weapons, we take captive every thought that we have and try to make it obedient to Christ. Our thoughts, your thoughts, we try to take those things, and our thoughts go a lot of different ways other than Jesus, don't they? In the course of our week, if you inventoried where your mind went when it strayed off one direction or another, I'm guessing it wasn't to your Bible every time, was it? But we can take our thoughts and, and take our daily lives, and we can surrender them more and more to Jesus, and using prayer, and using fasting, and using study of God's Word, and the guidance of the Spirit, and, and a loving heart, we can actually be moved and become different because of it. And God wants to do that. He wants to demolish those strongholds. Um, verse 6, he says, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. This is sort of a veiled threat. We're going to see a few of these. But Paul is saying in closing, you think I'm going to be timid, but I'm going to be strong. And by the time, by the, by the way, by the time I get there to Corinth, be ready because I'm going to actually address what's going on in the disobedience here. And I'm going to address this corrupt leadership. I will be bold with them because they're trying to pervert and misguide and corrupt the church. Uh, and that's going to get addressed too. Now, a natural question is, what's underlying this? Why are people trusting in the world's ways and not God's way? Why are people trying to solve their problems and walk through their, the things God's called them to in their life, their ministries? Why are they trying to do that by the resources of the world instead of the resources of God. And Paul is going to address that very question here in this next section with verses 7 through 11. So let's read that now. You are judging by appearances. If anyone is confident that they belong to Christ, they should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as they do. So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I do not want to seem to be trying to frighten you with my letters. For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters, when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. All right, so that opening section there, verse 7, he says, you are judging by appearances. That's really what's going on with the super apostles. They look really shiny and pretty. They talk in really fancy ways. They know all the thousand dollar words to use. And so the church itself is getting led astray because of this. They're not asking what the character of these people is like or what's really in their hearts. They're not doing that examining. They're not praying or looking for discernment as they follow these folks. And so because they're only focused on appearances, they're now being led astray and Paul points out here, underpinning this, he says, if anyone's confident that they belong to Christ, that's the super apostles, they're confident they belong to Christ, well, they should consider that we belong to Christ as much as they do. That when Jesus saved us, he saved all of us, and that Jesus doesn't love them more just because, you know, they're prettier. That's not what's going on here or because they're more charming or more clever. God loves us all, and they should consider that maybe God's going to use other people as well, and that God will entrust them. And this is one of the big premises that's being missed. So verse 8, um, it says, So even if I boast somewhat freely about the authority the Lord gave us for building you up rather than tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. What Paul is referencing here is the fact that he came and planted this church. That Paul, he's saying, I'm not going to brag about myself, but I will brag about one thing, and that's that God called me here. When Paul went to Corinth, it wasn't because Paul had just always wanted to go to Corinth and plant a church there. It wasn't that at all. It's because he prayed, he asked God for guidance, and God said, guess what, Paul? Time to go to Corinth. And by the way, if you wonder if Paul was called to Corinth or not, however unimpressive or impressive you might find him, what happened when he got there? 
Hundreds of people came to know Jesus, the very people he's talking to right now. And so Paul is in this unique position to point out, you know, these super apostles, they talk really highly about how great they are, but God did call me there. He told me to go to you guys and to share the gospel with you. And when you heard that good news, you responded to it. The very fact that you're a believer today, Paul's able to argue, is, is because of that act. And so Paul's saying, I'm not boasting that I'm that great. Paul doesn't believe he is. He's saying, I'm boasting that God is that great. If God called me there, God will finish what he started. And this is a very interesting aspect of this. Paul could try to make an argument and say, well, you know, that guy, he says he's better looking than me, but my bicep's slightly bigger. So, I mean, I'm kind of better, right? Or, you know, I know my hairline's receding a little bit, but I have curly hair, and he doesn't have curly, and we all like curly hair more, right? And so you can make whatever argument you want. Paul could make these earthly arguments. He could try to argue he was two IQ points higher than one of them or something like that. He doesn't do any of that. Paul's not playing that game. He's just saying, look it, I know you might not think I'm the best person for the job, but I am the person God called to do it. And so, and so here I am doing it. And the very fact that God has accomplished what he has testifies to that calling that he gave and that he's strong enough to do it. And so I'm not measuring by appearances or by earthly standards. I'm just going to go with what God called me to do. And so I should have some right to speak into this. I won't be ashamed of the fact that God called me to this. Verse 9, I don't want to seem like I'm trying to frighten you with my letters. Paul's concerned they might take this letter the wrong way. But at the same time, he needs to say some of this stuff and try to address it. He says in verse 10, For some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he's unimpressive, and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters we will, when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we're present. So Paul is giving a quote here of what the super apostles are saying about him, and it's very similar to what was said before. His letters are weighty and forceful. He's, he's a good writer, I'll give you that. The guy writes pretty well. But when he's here, he's totally unimpressive. Notice they aren't saying what he's saying doesn't hold according to Scripture or uh, that, it's, that he's contra contradicting Scripture in some way. Their basic argument is he's not as pretty as we are, he's not as smart as we are, he's not as rich as we are, and so obviously we shouldn't be listening to him. He's unimpressive, and I'm super impressive, so listen to me instead, is basically the argument. Do we make some of our decisions that way today in our world? Yeah. I think our politics is a good example of that. It's really interesting how so many of our politicians do, uh, do the whole thing by just comparing about how I'm better than this person because of X or Y. Uh, but we as a people, we tend to buy into it. We tend to follow it. And uh, it's kind of sad. Character is something that's uh, become underrated in our society. And, and calling is something that's been underrated too. Instead, we, we focus on what's shiny and and try to live that out. And Paul points out, they make this accusation, but again, another sort of veiled threat with this, but I will be bold when I get there. You think I'm unimpressive, that's fine. I may not be impressive, but when I get there, I'm going to address what's going on, and we're going to stop this arrogance in the leadership and this corruption of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's finish out the last section, and we'll talk about how to apply this to our lives. Verses 12 through 18. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond the proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God Himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. We are not going too far in our boasting, as would be the case if we had not come to, you, come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. Neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of the work done by others. Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will continue to expand so that we may preach the gospel in regions beyond you. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory. But let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. That closing verse is a real thesis statement to what we're talking about. Now Paul, he's going back in verse 12 and he's talking about the, the essence of his argument. He says, we don't, we don't dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who classify and commend themselves. 
When they measure themselves, they measure and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise. So what Paul is basically saying here is these super apostles, they wake up every day and to show themselves that they're impressive, they go and they look around the room and they say, well, at least I'm smarter than him and I'm better looking than him and I'm more clever than her. And, and so you should listen to me because I'm better than all of these other people. Look at all the ways I'm better. And Paul is saying, I'm not going to engage in that game. That, that's a foolish game. And by the way, it tends to be. It, you're the unique person God made you to be, and you do your best to try to live out being the best version of that person for God's kingdom you can. God doesn't call you to be the other people in your life. He doesn't call you to be better than all the people in your life. And if that's the standard you're measuring your life, it's going to be a fairly miserable one, isn't it? Because there's always going to be somebody who is better than you are at something. And, and so for the super apostles, it's this game of arrogance and, and tit for tat. And, and even amongst themselves, you can bet some of them are saying, well, I gave a better sermon last week than he gave, so obviously I'm better than him. And so, you know, you should only listen to him sometimes when he agrees with me, but otherwise ignore him, because what would he know? Paul's not engaged in that. He, he's saying this isn't the right way to do it. God wouldn't approve of it. Verse 13, we, however, will not boast beyond the proper limits. So he says there's something we can boast about, but it's limited. But we'll confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that includes you. So here he's saying, I, I'm only going to brag once again about the calling God gave me. God decided for whatever reason to send me here to you. I, I told you who Jesus was. He bore fruit in that, and that lends credence to the fact that it was a legitimate calling in some sense. Um, and so he says, I'll take pride in that, that for whatever reason God chose me to do this. And Paul, again, isn't saying just because I'm that great. It's, it's quite the opposite. Paul's pretty, been pretty clear. It's just God that's that great. I'm not good enough. He is, but it always works out well that way. Uh, verse 14, we're not going too far in our boasting as we would in the case if we had not come to you, for we did get as far as you with the gospel of Christ. So he's saying if we hadn't actually fulfilled the calling, if we never went to you, then we wouldn't have a good reason to brag, would we? Because God told us to do something and we, then we didn't do it. So we're not going to brag because of that, but we actually came and we did what God said and God bore fruit with it, so that's good. And verse 15, this is really pointing back to the super apostles, neither do we go beyond our limits, nor are we going to boast about something beyond what we should, by boasting of the work done by others. And Paul is pointing out a pretty unique element of the super apostles here. Here they are walking into the room and saying, listen to me, I'm the smartest, I'm the one who should be in the center of attention and everything and should be in charge of everybody, and don't listen to him, by the way. And Paul is, in a sense, pointing out, hey, if God called them here, why haven't they won anyone to Jesus? If God has really you know, called them to be big leaders in the church, why aren't they growing the church? Why aren't more people coming to know who Jesus is because of them? And the obvious answer is because they just walked into something God used somebody else to do, and now they're claiming credit for it. Now they're saying, aren't I impressive? Isn't it incredible what I've done here? And it wasn't them that did it. It was, first of all, God who did it to begin with, as Paul has pointed out. But secondly, God used Paul in it, not them. So it's odd that they think they have this position. And he's pointing out, they're, they're getting out over their skis here. They're getting ahead of themselves. They're claiming an authority they don't have. Continuing in verse 15, he says, Our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. So he's hoping as their faith increases, they'll start working to evangelize other people, and, and they'll grow past that. Paul doesn't want to live in Corinth forever uh, and, and play babysitter to the church. He wants them to grow to maturity and start doing what the church should do, and there's a purpose for that. Verse 16, so that we can preach the gospel in regions beyond you. He wants to go to new places and plant new churches there. He senses God's calling there, but he feels this sort of parental shepherding responsibility of, I can't leave the church in Corinth in this mess. If I leave those people there leading in this way, it's going to break the church, and there's going to be a whole bunch of people who aren't going to be in God's kingdom anymore. So I have to shepherd that, but I really just want to go and lead new people to Jesus. For we do not want to boast about work already done in someone else's territory. He's not just going to go to a new place and say, aren't I great? There's already a church here. Verse 17, but let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends themselves who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. We could ask a lot of questions about why God chose Paul. For that matter, we could ask a lot of questions about why God chose you. Why did God put you in the situations you're in? Why did he give you the family he gave you or the coworkers he gave you uh, or the friendships he gave you? 
you probably have thought sometimes, you know, Pastor, I try really hard to talk to other people about who Jesus is, and I feel like I'm completely inadequate all the time. Couldn't God have found somebody better? That guy seems better. Why not use him? And what Paul's really getting at here is it's not you that validates your ministry. It's God that validates your ministry. He put these things in your path, but if he's the one who called you to do it, then he's the one who will see you through it and sustain you through it. And so I think from this passage, we have two really big takeaways we can take. You know, first of all, Paul is not saying ignore all godly standards in your leadership. Obviously, there are biblical criteria for what leaders should do, and if there's sin issues, those need to be addressed. But Paul here is pointing out that sometimes God doesn't call the exact person we'd imagine to do things. And yet, God, because he's really powerful, can still use them in that. So we need to encourage our leaders in that sense. But I think more importantly beyond that, for us in our daily lives as we read this passage, God has called you to a lot of things in your life. Again, there are relationships you have that others in your life never will. There's people you know who He's put you in the life of, and He wants you to love them and to encourage them and to talk to them about who Jesus is. And sometimes you might feel like, this is a lost, futile effort. I don't think this is ever going to work. Maybe you feel that way as a parent or as a grandparent or as a, as, a, as a child. Whatever the case might be in your familiar relationships, there's all different areas of your life where God has a calling for you, and sometimes we don't feel good enough for it. And Paul points out here, if God chose you for it, well, then God will sustain you through it if you use the spiritual weapons He gave you to do it. If you pray, if you fast, if you study His Word, if you stay focused on Him and listen to His Holy Spirit, you might not ever be good enough, but God is, and He'll see you through it. I think sometimes we get lost in our own lives thinking, I just can't do this. I mean, I'm here, but I don't know how I'll ever connect the dots. And I understand that. And there's times as a parent, I hope I'm not going to rack up too big a counseling bill for my kids later, you know? There's times as a pastor where I'm scratching my head and thinking, okay, what do I do here? And, and I'm sure you hit those situations. Maybe you've hit some of them last, in the last week. But the good news Paul is sharing with us here is that it's not a matter how big or awesome you are. You might feel totally inadequate, and you probably are. No offense, I am too. But God isn't. And if God called you to something in your life, God is sufficient to complete it. His strength is there. It's not you that are the biggest factor. It's Him. And if you realize that, then we start making a lot wiser decisions in our life, and we start trusting and resting on God instead of trying to use all the world's resources and the world's ways to solve our problems, which normally just makes it a whole lot worse and more complicated. But we've got to make that decision. All right, at this point, I'm going to call Nate forward, one of our elders, and Amy. They're going to lead us through our time of communion and offering. We can take some time to reflect on our relationship with Jesus through that. And uh, I'm going to head to the back here uh, as we get ready to, to have a baptism here in a few minutes. Uh, But as they're coming forward, I'll ask you to take a moment with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, maybe there's some people here who think they're better than Jesus was. I don't know. I sure hope not. There were people like that dealing with Paul, and if that's the case, I pray you would bring humility into that situation, not for the sake of hurting someone, but for the sake of renewing someone. But Lord, I suspect there's more people here today scratching their head wondering how on earth you ever thought they were going to pull it off in the thing you've called them to do. And Lord, I pray today that you'd help us to find peace knowing that we might not be as shiny as other people, but we're called. And you are sufficient for that calling. Lord, please help us to rest in your strength, to use the weapons you've given us, and to grow a deeper relationship with you through that process, coming to see you as the God who sustains us despite our brokenness and imperfection just as you were for Paul. Lord, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.